a reading from On the Dogma of the Church, an historical overview of the sources of ecclesiology by St. Hilarion Choitsky, the Hieromartyr, now available from Uncut Mountain Press. Preface The dogma concerning the Church may be termed the self-identification of the Church. It is this dogma that determines what the Church is and what distinguishes it from all that is not the Church. The Church is not a phenomenon of the natural earthly order, the mysterious depths of Church life, in accordance with the unfailing promise of Christ the Savior, are always and invariably enveloped by the grace-filled power of the Holy Spirit. The full depth of this mystical life of the Church is not, of course, subject to logical definitions and scholarly research. It is given directly to him who participates in it, as Hilary of Potier expressed in the words, This is the peculiar property of the Church, that when she makes herself known, then she is understood. For this reason, we may say that the self-identification of the Church is experienced specifically by one who dwells in the Church and is a living member of her living body. Nevertheless, since the inception of the Church, the theological thought of Church writers has undertaken, among other things, to define the essence of the Church and its properties in concepts comprehensible to the human mind. The brief definition of the Church presented in its symbol of faith could not be sufficient, since inevitable questions arose regarding the understanding of the creedal definition itself, and the very life of the Church insistently demanded that these questions be answered. The life of each person and his outward actions is intimately linked to his self-identification. Likewise, The outward life of the Church in many of its manifestations is determined by the Church's understanding of itself, that is, by the dogma concerning the Church. The questions that arose throughout history concerning Church practice roused Church theological thought to a more detailed clarification of the very concept of the Church. The same was required by the distortion of the true understanding of the Church wrought by heretics and schismatics. The first centuries of Christianity are peculiar in that throughout them, the Church frequently had to contend with errors that deviated from the truth, specifically in the doctrine concerning the Church. In the first centuries of Church life, we see several fairly complex movements founded on ideas linked in one way or another to the dogma concerning the Church. This is why, more than at any other time, Ecclesiastical theological thought in the first centuries focused its attention on clarifying the concept of the Church. The heresies and schisms that appeared in the Church merely spurred the fathers and teachers of the Church, quote, having received wisdom from God to set forth dogmas, which of old the fishermen set down in simple words, through the power of the Spirit in understanding. For thus was it fitting to acquire a simple exposition of our faith. Sessional Hymn, January 30th. The essays on the history of the dogma concerning the Church here presented are therefore devoted to a study of the pivotal points in the efforts of early Church theological thought toward expounding and elucidating Church doctrine concerning the Church. These pivotal points are determined by the most prominent anti-Church movements, founded on a distorted understanding of the Church with which the theologians of the early church did literally battle. These movements are Judaistic Christianity, Gnosticism, Montanism, Novationism, and Donatism. We therefore preface this study of the church writer's dogmatic struggle against these anti-church phenomena with a brief overview of the New Testament teaching concerning the church. Each of the above phenomena in its own right could be the subject of a whole series of scholarly studies. Hence, in our essays we will not be pursuing monographic exhaustiveness. Rather, we will primarily focus on studying those dogmatic outcomes on the question of the Church that resulted from dogmatic polemics motivated by one or another of the above phenomena. In our essays, the ends in view will not be those of Church history, but rather of the history of dogma. 
Only by thus limiting the task will it become possible to unite all the essays here presented into a single study, since the most prominent anti-church movements of old, which we have noted, may only be combined from the standpoint of dogmatic history. From the standpoint of the Christian teaching concerning the church that unfolded in the struggle to combat them. It is the author's view that a study of various questions from the history of the dogma concerning the church is of vital importance to church life and the duty of church theological scholarship. The question of the church is always an interesting and important question. One ought always to proceed from the concept of the church when resolving questions of church life, and frequently these questions essentially comprise a repetition or modification of old ones. The gates of hell, arrayed against the church in the uprising of heresies and errors, to this day give rise to numerous anti-church phenomena. Combating these phenomena is the task of the ecclesiastical figures of the day, but this fight must be grounded in the ancient church and linked to the treasury of the theological knowledge of the Catholic Church. One cannot help but notice how in our time questions arise and are discussed that have long been quite sufficiently resolved by the writers of the ancient church. Who is not aware that the question of the church is the chief, principal question in modern polemics with sectarianism in various forms? And of course, in conducting these polemics, one must always bear in mind the dogmatic conclusions reached by the theological thought of the ancient church. This is why a study on the history of the dogma concerning the church is able to meet the modern needs of church life. Western scholars have long and extensively been engaged in scholarly research of the history of the dogma concerning the church, Catholics and predominantly Protestants, people who are strangers to the church. For Alexei Komiakov, quite justifiably called Catholicism and Protestantism, quote, heresies against the dogma of the essence of the church, against its faith in its own self. The conclusions drawn by scholarship outside the church in studying the history of the dogma concerning the church are what obliged theological scholars within the church to take up this important subject themselves. We people of the church believe and confess that we belong to that church which Christ and his holy apostles established. In the symbol of faith, we call our church apostolic. The history of the dogma concerning the church is for us nothing less than the history of the academic and theological elucidation of the ever unified and unchanging concept of the church. The church and her self-identification have remained unified and unchanged from the time of Christ and the apostles to our own. Only scholarly and theological elucidation of the dogma concerning the church has altered in its breadth and depth, but scholarship outside the church takes an entirely different stance. The Rise of the Old Catholic Church is the title of a work by Albrecht Ritschel, which more than half a century hence laid the groundwork for that resolution of questions of church history and dogmatic history which, with certain amendments, is advanced to this day by adherents of the ritual school, predominantly in Protestant scholarship. The very title of the work is highly typical. To the question, what is the origin of the ecumenical church? One who is within the church may answer concisely and definitively. The church was founded by our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and His holy apostles. If, however, Entire exhaustive studies can be written on the origin of the church. It is apparent that the authors of these studies take a completely different view of the Catholic Church. Similarly titled Protestant works chronologically span over 200 years. Clearly, in the opinion of their authors, the church originated over the course of entire centuries. Christ and the apostles did not establish the Catholic Church. If indeed they did establish any church at all, it was certainly not the one that later became known as the Catholic Church. The latter church originated on its own out of various elements, influenced by numerous conditions, and in the final analysis, actually contradicts Christ and the apostles. 
It was not heretics and schismatics who distorted the concept of the church, but rather the church itself gradually altered its essence, retreating from its former self-identification. For many Protestant scholars, the ancient anti-church heretical movements we mentioned before are vestiges of the ancient concept of the church, as surmised based on scant and ambiguous information. Thus, it was not heretics who distorted the ancient doctrine concerning the church, but the church itself, which, in condemning Montanism, for example, condemned and declared as heresy something that was formerly ecclesial, its own doctrine concerning the church. The church, as Christ and his apostles envisioned it, lasted for a very short time. By the second century, the Catholic church that had originated declared it a heresy, destroyed it, and usurped its place. What was formed was not the apostolic church, but a church hostile to that of the apostles. Along with historical events in the life of the church, changes of the most radical kind were also taking place in the very concept of the church. For example, in the third century, a doctrine of the sanctity of the church was developed in total contradiction to what had been said on the subject in the second century. It seems it would not be an overstatement to say that this kind of idea of the history of the dogma concerning the church kills and undermines all faith in the church. If we agree with the Protestant exposition of the history of the dogma concerning the church, we must discard the ninth article of the symbol of faith, which combines the Catholic Church with the Apostolic Church. It is therefore the duty of theological scholarship within the church to give its own exposition of the history of the dogma concerning the church, which may be used to counter how that history is framed outside the church. To this day, we might observe, this duty remains almost entirely undischarged. There have been works devoted to the history of the dogma concerning the church, but these have long become obsolete and do not at all consider the new questions that have arisen in this arena of scholarly knowledge over the last several decades. It is this circumstance that determines the nature of the present work. On various questions pertaining to the history of the dogma concerning the Church, we are preceded by scholars outside the Church with whom we have a significant and fundamental difference of opinion. By the same token, there are a great many works dealing in one way or another with the history of the dogma concerning the Church, since the history of the dogma concerning the Church is intimately linked to the history of various aspects of Church life and the teaching of various church writers concerning the church has its explanation in the historical circumstances of their lives and their ecclesiastical and literary work. For this reason, nearly every scholarly book on the history of the church or patristic theology has proven to have some bearing on certain questions, often minute and highly particular, in our own study. Such an abundance of scholarly literature renders us completely unable to systematically review all the opinions expressed on each of the multitudinous and very nearly innumerable questions in our study. If we were to undertake not to leave a single stated opinion without exposition and analysis, we would have to write an entire study on each separate question. Only by adopting a different approach can we combine an entire series of complex, intertwined questions of the greatest importance in a single study. We therefore choose the approach of historical criticism of the primary sources. Our attention will be concentrated primarily on remnants of early church literature, on essays by the writers of the ancient church who undertook to elucidate the teaching of the church. The multitudinous scholarly works we have studied served merely as our aids in achieving this stated goal. Nevertheless, we hold it impossible to completely pass over in silence all the variety and richness of content of these frequently monumental, informative, and interesting works, and at times we will not be sparing with quotes and citations therefrom. We merely do not undertake their complete and systematic usage else we would constantly be obliged to stray far from the topic at hand. We will concentrate only on the most general ideas, 
most frequently encountered among modern scholars of church history and dogmatic history, and holding the majority of these ideas inadmissible for theological scholarship within the church. In our study of the primary sources, along with a positive exposition and explanation of their substance, we will point out facts within them that disprove or at least shake the foundations of Protestant scholarship's prevailing representation of the history of the dogma concerning the Church. In our desire to discern the development of ecclesial self-identification in the writings and theological literature of the ancient Church in the course of our study, we may at times have erred from the truth by incorrectly conveying the thinking of the ancient Church, and passing off our own folly as church doctrine. We can therefore do no better than to say in the words of the blessed Augustine, As many things as you will have ascertained to be true, keep and bestow them to the Catholic Church. Those that you will have perceived to be false, spit them out and forgive me who am a man. The author holds all doubt as to the perfect truth of the one Orthodox Church of Christ to be unacceptable. Such doubt may result either from ignorance or from sinfulness. Laboring on the question of the Church has taught the author to read the prayer for the Church from the daily commemorations with particular love and trepidation of heart. Among the first remember, O Lord, thy holy Catholic and apostolic Church which thou hast preserved by thy precious blood, and establish, strengthen, and expand, increase, pacify, and keep her unconquerable by the gates of Hades. Calm the dissensions of the churches, quench the raging of the nations, and quickly destroy and uproot the rising of heresy, and bring them to naught by the power of thy Holy Spirit. September 25th, 1912, Commemoration of the Venerable Sergius.